Hi, I'm Graham Glenn, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching, Learning Plus Technology at Stony Brook University. And this is Innovations in Education. we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches to teaching and applications of educational technology that have had a positive effect on student learning. On this show I'm joined by Kathleen Scherfen, a professor in the School of Nursing and also a winner of the Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence. We will be discussing guided inquiry as a teaching approach. Kathleen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about the courses that you teach? Absolutely. We have a very exciting uh, program now. It's a doctorate in nursing practice and it's a doctorate for nurses who are nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, and also are nurse anesthetists. They come back full time to get a doctorate in clinical inquiry. And they are very excited about doing these projects because they're out in the real world every day. And so they bring with them to the program their research idea and then they develop it through a process of inquiry during four semesters, which is a two-year period, and during this time frame, they infuse it with many different courses that they take. So for example, I just came from being with these students. There are 30 in a cohort. It's an executive cohort program. And they were just taking the course called epidemiology. So they're now infusing their clinical inquiry with the epidemiologic data that supports the patient population that they're working with. So for example, one student is a neonatal ICU nurse practitioner. So he talks about the epidemiology and the increase in neonates in this country and the reasons for that. Someone else was doing obesity and metabolic syndrome and they have the statistics on how markedly adult obesity has changed since the 1970s. So in traditional under, undergraduate education we tend to pour a lot of information into students mm -hmm. and my understanding here is that you are actually trying to make the students ca very capable people at finding the information that they need. How, how do you go about doing that? Well absolutely because in a practice profession like nursing any information we poured in would be outdated in a very short mm -hmm. period of time. So we have really changed our whole teaching methodology. We deliver our program in a blended method and what we do is a lot of the content is available in an online delivery system. We then use what would be traditionally classroom time for the scholarly inquiry where they learn to search scholarly databases, they learn to put together and combine what they are learning to actual case studies, practice situations, and research projects in the real world. And are they doing this in front of computers in the classroom or just talking about how they all found their, their data for their project? It's actually a mix. We do have a lot of computer availability and our students actually utilize that a great deal. But we, we also revert back to traditional seminar approach. But the students, for example, today were presenting their ideas in PowerPoint presentations that they had put together for each other. They critiqued them, they evaluated them, and they shared a great deal of knowledge with each other, including how they obtained the knowledge, not just what the knowledge was. So are these done as individual projects? Are you doing them as group projects? How is that performed? Well, we have a combination. So there are some projects that are individually based and then a large number that are group based. And we put our students together in teams because in the actual practice of nursing, you practice with a group of other professionals right. into professional practice. So in preparing them for the future, one of the skills that we want to send them forth with is this ability. And how do you prepare them to do that? Well, the preparation involves an orientation to our computer delivery method 
and an intensive orientation to the databases that actually this wonderful library has available in the Health Sciences Center in the clinical fields. We also um, prepare them by teaching them the technologies in preparing posters for dissemination of their knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, uh, we do that in an intensive um, environment where at the beginning of the program, they are in residency for a week where we um, upgrade their skill set. Tell me a little bit about the difference between working in groups and working on problem-based learning, because I know you're, you're very focused on problem-based learning. Absolutely. And again, um, patient care is problem-based. Mm -hmm. We have to identify problems and treat them. So problem-based learning is a way in which we provide a case and we provide guided questions but the students are responsible to find the answers. Okay. And they come together as a small group and they will actually have a team leader which would rotate and they divide up the case and they divide up solving each question among the group. And some of the solutions are data-based, some of them are available from scholarly articles, and some of it requires that they go forth and, for example, interview this the CEO of the medical center. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very mixed methodology. Then they come back as a group and present their findings. They critique and then we challenge them again and we take the case to the next level. Because in healthcare, all cases are not solved in one experience. So we, what we do is we give them a complication Mm -hmm. We give them an issue, well, you've solved the case, but now the patient is not following the recommendations. Or you have a side effect from the drug. Absolutely, that you've absolutely. So that they have to sort of think on their feet, now what would I do in order to change this? Group discussion, and they come to conclusions. And these groups are led by faculty mentors. So although the students do most of the group work, there is a faculty member there to guide and to support and really to validate their findings and give them clarification when necessary. So one of the, the analogies that, that we commonly hear about information is it's like drinking water from a fire hose. That there's, mm -hmm. One of our problems now is not a lack of access to information mm -hmm. but the fact that we're overwhelmed by mm -hmm. it. How do you teach the students to discriminate good information from bad? That's a very important component. Um, in healthcare, we teach what is called evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. And we teach students how to critique the evidence. And we're very lucky in healthcare in that we have a number of databases that have been pre-critiqued for right. us mm -hmm. and only permit peer-reviewed random clinical control trials, for example. So we but forgive me, I think at one point you did mention that you allow the students also to go out to the internet. Oh yes we do. Is, you know, oh yes we obviously do. Obviously peer reviewed. Yes we do. So we have the, the traditional databases and then they go to the internet. And we actually treat teach them, we have some tools actually, how to evaluate information. And they go through these tools to see if this information meets criteria and can be used in practice or used in informing practice versus that which they know is available. So for example, we'll say what guidelines are available for diabetes care? Mm -hmm. And they will go to the internet and they will find everything from um, a diabetic who came up with their own guidelines to something produced by a national consensus group. And we actually have an evaluative tool that they then need to put into place. And they then evaluate and let us know, you know, who developed this? Was it a consensus group of professionals? Was it a group of well-meaning patients? And they then learn how to inform patients based on good evidence. Now, you've been primarily talking about graduate students. Mm -hmm. What about undergraduates, are they more challenging? Do you, do you get them involved in research projects and oh, so on? They're the best <laughs> because they're coming to us very technologically savvy, okay. frankly. And so we start the same approach with them. Although, as you say, we pour a little more information into them because they don't have the context yet, mm -hmm. where the graduate students have the context. So 
I would say initially in their program, we do a little more um, traditional lecturing, but we always have clinical cases, clinical correlates, and very early on begin this process. And we've been very, very lucky because most of the information available in undergraduate nursing techs today have a lot of supportive material in online delivery approaches. So those students actually love the inquiry process. They love to do research studies. Um, certainly they're not the magnitude of a graduate student, mm -hmm. but they are very, very good. It could be on hand washing techniques. They could note on a unit that, you know, there are certain t people that don't comply and they'll, they'll do an intervention and they'll see if it works. So they're very engaged in this. They also do a lot of small group presentations. And uh, when you look at their PowerPoint presentations or posters, they are phenomenal because they grew up in this technological age where our older students need to be upgraded in that area. Do you think they're more successful learners because of this? I think they're different learners. I think they have learned how to trust this new communication technology and use it well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really informing their learning uh, in new ways and informing us how to support their learning in new ways. They're actually very much uh, the students who are demanding this more um, interactive, unique approach to learning. If you had a faculty member come to you and say, I'm, you know, I'm just about to start teaching in nursing, can you give me a few tips on how I could be a better teacher? What would those be? Well, the first thing I would tell them is to have a very strong philosophy to support their teaching, uh, a strong belief in where they want to take students, and then become as creative as possible in terms of finding unique ways to bring them there. Why is it important to have a strong philosophy? The strong philosophy actually guides your very practice and why you are there for the students. So if you believe that you're there just to impart your knowledge mm -hmm. and they then go forth with the word, right. um, that is one philosophy, but it will not be effective in terms of a practice profession. So it needs to be a more collaborative, a more supportive faculty philosophy. So what I'm interested by is the fact that you said strong. Is it, do the students challenge the instructor's philosophy? Do you think that they have to defend it to the students? No, they don't have to defend their philosophy, but I will say that student evaluation, both of course content delivery and faculty delivery of content, is a very important piece of our reappointment process mm -hmm. and our tenure process. And I think I have great pride in that because it really allows students to give input in a constructive way to help support faculty development. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way street, not just faculty evaluating students continually. So although they don't challenge it, they may try to nudge it a little bit or change it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think we all benefit from right. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kathleen, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. If you have any questions for our guest, uh, you can search our Facebook site. Just look for Innovations in Education. We will also post Kathleen's contact information on the TLT website at tlt.stonybrook.edu. I'm Graham Glynn, and I hope you'll join me on the next interesting episode of Innovations in Education. <laughs>